kind of taking a you know mental reset but um i'm in the mood so let's throw in a, another speedrun game on my frankfurt airport account where a lot of the pr recent games have been a little bit suspicious some of the games have been weird like quick wins it seems like i've been a little bit cursed but fingers crossed hopefully we get a good one today because i'm a little higher rated i might be slightly more silent and contemplative during the game and then air out my thoughts afterward we'll see how it goes so seeking a 15 plus 10 game most recent game was was against someone who was banned yeah i mean i lost the 10 plus 5 game to a cheater so there's been a couple of of suspicious recent games yeah okay let's play manderly on the green who i think is probably in the stream all right good luck manderly okay e4 so as usual i'm going to play my real opening so we start off with a sicilian and we play into the Nidorf, d6. C3, okay, so this is called the Delayed Alipin. Um, it's a relatively harmless anti-Sicilian system, but it's gained a lot of popularity recently. And if Black is not prepared, just like any other anti-Sicilian, like the Grand Prix attack or like the Moscow variation, it can be very, very dangerous against a poorly prepared opponent. But if you position your pieces accurately, Black should equalize with relatively little issues. First step is to play knight f6, of course. And one of the appeals, yeah, one of the biggest appeals of playing this line for beginners is that knight takes e4, loses a piece to the very uh, common trap queen a4 check, forking the knight and the king. I think this is probably the most commonly missed type of fork uh, in the opening. It involves like queen a4 and queen a5. It's a very easy move to forget about. So obviously we don't touch this pawn. Um, h3 is actually not the main move. Uh, this is a sideline. The main move, as far as I know, is bishop e2. Uh, recently, the Kopec system, bishop d3, has been quite popular. Even bishop b5 check I've seen recently tried. So a lot of moves here. h3, I'm pretty sure that the main move is knight c6 here. Yeah, bishop d3. So this is kind of called the Kopec system. It's a very weird-looking move until you kind of ask yourself, what is white's follow-up? And then it becomes very obvious. White wants to drop the bishop back to c2 and control the center uh, with d4. And the two main ways for black to fight this are either to try to prevent d4 from happening uh, or to allow d4, but to position our pieces in such a way uh, that even if white occupies the center, it doesn't necessarily mean that white is like much better or anything. So it's a very tricky system. I will be honest, I don't know in this position what is the best, what is the top engine line, uh, what are the top guns play recently. So we're just going to think on our own, and I'm going to choose a setup here that's hopefully not quite as theoretical, even if it means... Uh, that were slightly worse. So I've played this kind of setup against Magnus in in our blitz and bullet matches, and he always likes he always likes to push g6, and he always tends to allow white uh, to play d4 and then try to attack the center from a distance. So we're gonna do that. We're gonna we're gonna play the dragon setup with g6. Uh, presumably, our opponent is going to yeah bishop c2. Okay, Fianchettoing bishop g7. So we are deciding to allow d4. Uh, we're not going to try to prevent that move. Okay, because white castled, he's also giving us the opportunity to push e5, which is another interesting setup. So I would say that largely the, the setup that we choose as black is kind of a matter of taste. It's a matter of, okay, what kind of position do you prefer? What kind of position do you tend to thrive in? Here, I actually really like the look of e5. I actually really, really like the look of e5 because it, it highly discourages white from pushing d4, even though d4 is still possible. Uh, because our opponent gave us this opportunity, let's push e5, creating a bind, a clamp on the d4 square. And now if white plays d4, it leads to a, a big series of trades. And at the end of those trades, uh, the bishop on g7 will reopen and once again, lord over the long diagonal. Now this type of move, a newer player in like the 15, 1600 range might look at it and kind of frown and say, well, doesn't this move have a lot of positional drawbacks? First of all, we're creating a hole on d5. Second of all, aren't we blunting uh, the bishop on g7? To the second point, I would repeat something I've said multiple times before, which is that you should not really think of the bishop as an individual piece. You should think of the bishop and the pawn on e5 as a unit. Uh, together, they're exerting influence over the d4 square, which is the most important square in the position. As for the d5 square, yes, it's a hole, but can white really occupy it effectively? The answer is no. White cannot easily get a knight to d5. The square itself is defended by our knight. Uh, so these drawbacks are, are real but the benefits outweigh them in this particular instance. 
So it kind of looks like an awkward move. E5 is rarely combined with a Fianchetto, but in this particular case, I like this setup. And we have nice central control too. Okay, so our opponent seems to be relying on the move D3. I don't think that at this point they're going to go D4. Although maybe you never know. D4 is still possible from White's perspective. Um, Stoakilla is asking, what if he goes to C4 to get the knight out? Okay, so what? Okay, White puts a knight on C4. Big deal. What's, what's that knight doing? We can push it away with B5. We can push it away with bishop B6. Okay, D4, very committal decision. So obviously we take. That's the whole point. We take twice. Doesn't really matter which piece we take with. I mean, taking with the knight is a little bit too committal because we can take with a pawn. Presumably our opponent will recapture, and then we can decide whether we want to play knight takes d4 or whether we want to keep the tension and play some neutral move like rook e8. So knight takes d4 is a little bit less smart because it commits you to trading everything on d4. Do we have to take on d4? No, but... The whole purpose of this setup was to play E takes in the event that he pushed E4. This was the, the Zen of the setup. Okay, so now we have to think very deeply after they take on D4. And I'll take a little bit of time in silence if Knight takes D4 is on the board. Yeah, D6 is a weakness, but there's other aspects of the position. You can't just look at one pawn weakness in isolation and say, okay, the position sucks. We have a lot of strengths. We have a development advantage. White's queen side is undeveloped. We have a monster powerhouse on g7 and e4 is a very targetable pawn yes it's well defended but it can be easily targeted by a rook from the e-file and as i'll show you after the game um this type of structure occurs in the Rui lopez so i have quite a bit of experience with it from the black side uh and it's usually fine for black even though yes d6 is uh, a target for white okay so let me think here for a minute or two takes takes bishop b6 there is a, 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 a sequence that I'm leaning toward, but I'm trying to double check it. Okay, so takes, takes, bishop b6. Takes, takes, knight g4, queen d1. That's not good. Takes, takes, queen c7. Don't like it. Queen b6 is an interesting move. Um, rook e8 is an interesting... Rook e8 is a very interesting move. Actually, rook e8 is a very, very tricky move. Rook e8, knight b5, d5. Okay, complicated. Yeah, rookie eight, knight b5, d5. Not sure what's going on there. Bishop f4. Knight takes d4 is the simpler move. Queen takes d4, and then just bishop e6, completing our development. Simple, straightforward chess, but it also doesn't cause as many problems to white. Hmm. Now, this is a very difficult position to continue properly, and this is why I'm taking time. Huh. Okay. Yeah, I've settled on rookie eight. I've settled on rookie eight. And I'll spell out my thoughts a little bit more, more deeply after the game. But in general, I s select options that keep the tension. I've talked about this before. This is a bit of a nebulous concept, keeping the tension. But if there is a choice between getting a simpler position and keeping it more complicated, I like to keep it more complicated because it forces the opposing side to make decisions. This is one of the most important general pieces of advice is if you want to defeat a higher rated player who knows their fundamentals, you want to force them into difficult decisions. And so often that means not forcing the action, but making these kind of cagey improving moves. And now if you put yourself in our opponent's shoes, suddenly he's got a big choice. Okay, D do they play knight b5 and hit the pawn like that? Do they take on c6? Who does this trade favor? That has to be evaluated. Do they just continue with casual development? Knight c3 also looks fine. And this is often how you get players in this rating range to make mistakes because they get impatient or they don't evaluate something correctly. Of course, in some situations, you have to force the action. This is why when I'm like kind of ag agnostic between two different options, I chose the one which passes the ball back to our opponent. So give your opponent choices, particularly if they're in time pressure. This is why the common advice is when your opponent is in time pressure, definitely don't force the action because the hardest thing to do in time pressure is to make a decision. Of course, if there's forced mate, check it, go for forced mate. But this is for situations where you're not totally sure of the correct move. Okay, so our opponent correctly taking their time. Yeah, queen b6 was on my radar, but I didn't like knight takes c6. I'll talk about this moment after the game. Are we worried about bishop a4? Absolutely not. Bishop a4 is just a feeble one-move threat. Okay, knight f3. Let's talk about that after the game. Yeah, this is fine. Dropping away the knight. 
Okay, so now there's many options for us. We can definitely consider d5. This is the direct attempt to eradicate the biggest weakness. We can go knight b4, try to aim for the bishop pair. Don't like this move as much. This seems a little bit superficial. We can continue with our development, bishop e6, rook c8, etc. Also don't love it. d5 seems to be most to the point here. Maybe it leads to, no wait, d5, ed, rook e1. Yeah, this is fine for us. We will be in the driver's seat if the center opens up because we have the better pieces. d5, e5, we seem to have knight e4. Yeah, my intuition is heavily screaming, pointing in the direction of d5. And now the complications reach kind of a peak where either the center opens up, and if the center opens up, my hope is that our superior bishop and white's lack of queenside development is going to make it difficult for white to keep the balance, even if the queens come off the board. Or if white pushes e5, again, I'm really trying to exploit white's lack of development here by opening up the center. This is kind of a basic chess principle, just applied in a very complex position. Again, white has a pretty vast choice here. Ed, e5, knight c3, bishop g5, takes on e5. Now, very important not to fall asleep and play knight takes d5. That loses a piece. Rook takes e8, check, and the queen is overloaded. So first, of course, we have to take on e1. Hopefully, you're able to follow that. And depending on the way that white recaptures, we will take on d5 either with a queen or with a knight. Also, queen takes d5 essentially drops a queen to rook takes e8, check. And then the knight is overloaded. So... Yeah, so definitely takes first. And let's wait for white to choose a recapture. Probably our opponent is like, okay, knight takes e1 is appealing because at least the queen is making contact with d5. Like, ooh, maybe I can get a GM to swap queens. But queen takes e1 is the more natural recapture because it keeps the knight on a developed square. Again, forcing our opponent into a pretty unpleasant decision. And each of these decisions taken alone is not a big deal, but they contribute to time pressure and they contribute to fatigue. Eventually, this is how you get your opponent to become impatient. Okay, so what do we take with? Well, Bartholomew would probably play queen takes d5, but queen takes d5 doesn't make any sense to me. It just walks into knight c3, uh, developing with tempo. Yeah, so knight takes d5. So knight takes d5, centralizing the knight, opening up the diagonal. And now we discourage knight c3 because that ruins the queenside pawn structure permanently. Also, this knight has a lot of potential. Knight b4 is kind of an unpleasant thought for white. Maybe the knight gets to d3. So my estimation is that black has a very small edge here, objectively. So in other words, white can probably keep the balance with accurate play, but these open center positions are extremely difficult to handle for anybody because there's just so much... The position is very undefined if that makes sense. When there's pawns in the center, you kind of know where the play is. Here, you have to kind of play in an open board, and that's always difficult. Bishop b3 is an excellent move, deploying the bishop to a good square. We should also probably develop our bishop. Where do we put it? Well, bishop b6 walks into the nasty knight g5. So I'm leaning toward bishop f5. It's the only other square that's available. Is there any problem with the queen being overloaded? Not that I see, because bishop f5, bishop g5, we can simply move our queen up to d7, and as an additional benefit that allows us to deploy our rook to e8. So, okay, unless I'm missing something, just bishop f5 is natural. Okay, but g4, g4 is not a scary move. g4 is an extremely weakening move. Yeah, bishop d3 is, I mean, we can even take the knight on b1 in an emergency. But yeah, we would presumably go bishop d3. I would be very, very happy to see g4 here. That just seems way too weakening intuitively. Also, g4, we can drop back to e6. And as I'll show after the game, in that position, knight g5 is actually far less dangerous. White is thinking. Our opponent's starting. Okay, knight a3. So opponent continues to try to work around all the obstacles and bring their pieces out. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm divided here between two moves. One thing I notice is that the only feasible way now to develop the bishop is with tempo, bishop g5. Because if bishop g5 were eliminated as an opportunity, then the pawn on b2 would hang if white brought the bishop out, for example, to d2 or to g5 with no tempo. So from that perspective, we could ask ourselves, how can we prevent or take the sting out of bishop g5? So h6 comes to mind, but h6 doesn't really further the goals of our position. Can we combine prophylaxis with something more efficient? How about queen d7? Getting the queen away from 
the bishop's line of fire. So then bishop g5, we can take on b2. Although that situation actually isn't that simple because white has the very nasty move rook d1, hitting the knight on d5. White could sack the pawn and go for the initiative. Okay, so that complicates things a little bit. Even if our opponent doesn't find it, it's not something I want to allow. So maybe, maybe after queen d7, bishop g5, we could just go rook to e8 and keep bringing our pieces out. Queen c7 would blunder the knight on d5. The other option is to play knight b4. But if we play knight d before, then we open up the diagonal for white's bishop. So kind of everything has a drawback here. To me, the most natural still seems to be queen d7. Let's opt for this move. And we'll see what white's reaction is. I don't know if anybody was able to follow what I just said about bishop g5, but we'll, we'll cross that bridge if we get there. Yeah, still looks like we're very much in the driver's seat here causing a lot of problems. Our opponent is doing a great job of navigating them, but hopefully eventually they crack under the pressure. Thank you, crack, <laughs> crack man for the prime. Very apt timing. Depends on what white does. If it was black to move here, of course, the next move is rook e8. This should be obvious to you, even if you're a beginner. I mean, there's only one piece that's not playing, and that's the rook, and, you know, you could bring it to an open file with tempo. Yeah, the knight on d5 is soft. That is the focal point, probably, of white's counterplay, but it takes a lot of skill to correctly exploit the weakness of this knight. And most beginner players might even play bishop takes d5 and just say, okay, let me just get this knight off the board. But that plays right into our hands. It gives us the bishop pair. The queen on d5 will be unassailable. It's almost a losing move positionally to give away this bishop. Because without this bishop, white is white's position just com comes unstuck. Queen d1, attacking the knight directly. Okay. So the question is, do we move the knight or we do, do we defend it? Rook d8, bishop g5 doesn't look appetizing in the least. Our opponent's trying to punish us for not playing h6. <laughs> okay. What else is available here? Knight c to b4 protects the knight. Knight c to b4 actually looks pretty lovely because it also prepares knight d3. And it, hit, it protects the other knight. Could we go knight d before? Yes, but that allows the queen trade. And if possible, I'd like to avoid the queen trade here. It slightly lessens the pressure on white's position, although still that endgame looks very nasty for white, actually. So maybe knight d before is a good option as well. Knight b6, also fine, but a little bit more passive than knight d before. Okay, let's think for a second. It's a big decision here. Very tempting to just go into an, a better endgame here and manage our risk. Very, very tempting to just squeeze the advantage in the end game, even if it's not the most interesting option for the viewers. But let's think, knight c before or knight d before my candidate moves here. I'm really not sure about this, but we're gonna go knight c before, we're gonna keep the queens. I think YouTube watching this just let out a collective sigh of relief, no end game for now. Yeah, the thing is this construction looks very, in general, when you have one knight defending another knight, that's a very tactically vulnerable construction because knights are easy to kick. But here, of course, white can't play a3. There's a knight on that square. And also, the biggest thing is that knight is coming to d3 to cut off the queen. And notice that the situation just continues to progressively get more and more complicated. There's so much going on here. It's very, very easy to blunder for white. And white's clock continues to dwindle. So I'm trying to like put pressure on all fronts here. And bit by bit, I think our opponent is already starting to crack. I think queen d1 was a mistake. I think the only move to keep the relative balance was bishop g5. That's my theory. We'll check with the engine after the game. Maybe every move is a mistake. We'll see. Yeah, white is stuck here. That's the thing. White is stuck because of the b2 pawn. So nothing is really moving here for white. Nothing is really moving here at all for white. Okay, knight d4. I, I, I was sort of expecting this move. Um, white is trying to eliminate this very important bishop, but this bishop anchors our whole position. So can we avoid giving it away? Can we avoid giving this bishop away? Well, we can sack it on h3. Not the stupidest option, but I think it's on sound. We can also sandwich it on d3. And bishop d3 looks like a very artificial move, but it, it attacks the knight, actually. So we have to tread very carefully here. Now the knight is, you know, like Atlas holding the world on its shoulders. This is ripe for an overloading tactic, but I don't see one. I don't see a way that white can challenge this knight effectively. Like bishop takes d5, we just play queen takes d5. Obviously, we don't play knight takes d5 and give up the bishop. 
And because we are attacking White's knight, we're not giving White time to generate some sort of tactic against this knight, I think. Okay, so knight on d4 is currently hanging. My guess is that my opponent's next move will force us to do quite a bit of calculation. Yeah, chess is a very complicated game. I also don't really know what's going on here. I'm just banking on the fact that my pieces are more active, and eventually I think that's going to bring us success. But you have to be very, very patient here. Yeah, five minutes now for our opponent. Not a lot of time. Not a lot of time. Okay, people are throwing out some moves, but it's hard for me to address them during the game because the game is going. Knight dc2, knight ac2. Yeah, definitely one of these is the best move. Um, bishop e3 is also likely, but that is a serious concession. Then we can trade on e3, and we've weakened white's king side quite a bit. Okay, four and a half minutes now. Yeah, actually, bishop e3 is a blunder. We just play knight takes e3 and bishop takes d4. Wins two pawns by force. Yeah, let's see. Expecting a move soon. Yeah, and, and for higher-rated players watching this, you shouldn't just dismiss the impact that this is having on our opponent's clock. This is part of the strategy. I mean, this is how you get people, is you get them low on time, and then the mistakes start. And soon, our opponent's going to start feeling the heat on the clock. Okay, this is quite a long think. Over three minutes. Bishop to d2 just blunders the knight on d4. I don't understand that move. It doesn't address the threat. Okay, waiting. Okay, knight ac2. After a long think, a good move. Okay, so first question is, does white have a threat? Like, if it were white to move, what would white do? Because this will inform our decision. So you would think that the threat is knight takes b4, but that's not a threat because we just recapture with a knight and everything is safe. Is bishop takes d5 a threat? That might be a bigger problem for us. Okay, that leads to some complications, but it's an unpleasant move. Bishop takes d5. It's a move I would like to take the sting out of. So, first of all, rook c8 comes to mind, because I'm also, in the back of my head, I'm keeping in mind that there is a piece that we haven't activated yet, and all things let, left alone, activating that piece would be a good idea. And, and the c file seems to be where the parties are happening. This is, this is Greek row. So maybe we can play rook c8. If bishop takes d5... Maybe we can go, well, at the very least, we have bishop takes c2 there. But probably knight takes c2 is borderline winning after bishop takes d5, or maybe not. Actually, very hard for me to tell. Rook c8, bishop takes d5, bishop takes c2, knight takes c2, knight takes c2, rook b1, white is surviving somehow, knight back to b4. We can win a pawn there. At least we can win a pawn. Hmm. And as a backup option... We can play queen takes d5, and we can get into a much, much better endgame. Okay, excellent. I think this is a very reasonable option that keeps the tension. Applying pressure on the knight on c2. Maybe there was something more tactical. I didn't see it. Okay, if white plays a3, we can just play knight takes c2. a3 is not a threatening move. It just forces a trade, but that trade doesn't necessarily favor white. Maybe it does. Maybe I didn't give a3 the attention that it deserved. But rook c8 just feels very, very natural. This feels like the, the right place for the rook because it's, it's, it's you know, doing a lot on the c-file, if that makes sense. Believe it or not, it's only been 19 moves. This is the thing about these very tense games is they, they're a lot shorter than you might think they are. Okay, knight takes before. We play knight takes before. The knight still protects the bishop. And again, white has this problem with the knight on d4. My guess is that a3 was the best move here, but let's see how the game unfolds. I mean, no, I don't. To my knowledge, my opponent is not a GM. And playing decent is not a good bar for a GM level. Okay. So obviously, I'm anticipating some knight move. No, a3. Okay, that seems to be a panicky reaction. Let's see. So bishop takes d4, a takes b4. Uh huh, maybe not. Maybe, yes, maybe it's a really smart move that I didn't give enough attention to. It's probably the case, actually. Okay, wait, I have an interesting idea here. I have to calculate it. Okay, there's some crazy complications here that could be... Wow. Okay, that's winning for me. I just calculated a really important line. Um, yeah, and that will... Okay, so bishop takes d4, which is probably counterintuitive to most people. Most people would be very inclined, if I understand people's thinking, to, to take with the queen, because it gives you a sense of security to have the queen in the center. Now, after a, b... 
the bishop will be hanging, except that's also a false statement. The bishop is not hanging because the bishop takes f2 check. But, okay, congrats. What do we do with that? Bishop takes f2, sacrifices don't work. King takes f2. I feel like the attack fizzles out quickly. My idea here was to play a pretty straightforward move. Queen to f5. Attacking f2. And actually, never mind. For some reason, I thought queen takes bishop was a thing, but it's actually not a thing because the bishop is protected. So continuing to pile up the pressure here on white's position and trying to force more concessions. Already, we've weakened their pawn structure on the queen side. Already, we have pressure on f2, and the time advantage continues to grow. All right. One minute. The pawn has to be defended. How does white do it? Yeah, this is where time starts becoming a huge factor. Bishop e3 is the best move, I'm 100% sure. White has to eliminate this monster on d4, even if it comes at the cost of further pawn structure damage. That probably gives white the best chances of survival, but it feels like our opponent is kind of progressively starting to panic. Thank you, Naname, for the raid. Appreciate Queen e1, very solid move as well. Trying to keep the pawn structure intact. Okay, now we need a money move of some sort. You know what would be very nice is if we could play rook e8 here. Probably some people are even thinking of this move and thinking, ah, queen takes e8, queen takes f2 mate. Unfortunately, queen takes e8 is a check. So one kind of Russian schoolboy type move would be to pu push the king up to g7 and prepare the move rook e8. But that seems slow. And that seems slow because after king g7, white brings their bishop out to e3. So in a very important detail, after king g7, bishop e3, if we play bishop takes b2, the a7 pawn is going to hang. So the move that I really want to discourage here is bishop e3, because that really, really extinguishes the flames of our initiative. Can we do that? Well, we could play a6, and we could simply protect that pawn so that when the bishop comes out, we take b2. That is just a pawn, but pawn is better than nothing. Is there anything with a little bit more pizzazz? Let's think. Anything that carries a little bit more bite? Than, than a6. If not, we'll play a6. No, king f8 is very bad. Hmm. Ah, actually, I'm not loving this, but let's go a6. Russian schoolboy move. Just slight improvement and also trying to limit the activity of the rook. No, rook c6, I think, allowed potentially some check on e8 that looked pretty nasty to me. Yeah, also bishop e3, there is rook e8, but in that position, there is this very nasty queen sack. Bishop takes d4. A ton of, like, very complicated details here some of which I will unpack after the game. But look at the clock, 30 seconds now for our opponent. And the panic is going to set in very shortly. Now, basically, they're playing on increment. Bishop e3 played. Okay, finally, we can claim a small prize. It's just a pawn. But it always just starts with a pawn, and then it progresses. Rook d1. Okay, now bishop c3 comes very close to trapping the queen, but white has bishop to back to d2. Okay, but that's a start. That's a start. Bishop c3, bishop d2 forced, maybe bishop back to d4, actually, because that is a nice square for the bishop. But then white goes back to e3. Ah, and maybe there we could go rook e8. Bishop takes d4, rook e1, rook e1, bishop b5, rook e7. No, don't love it. I'll show the line that I, I'm calculating there with the queen sack after the game. We need a very precise move here. I don't like the general placement of this bishop on b2. It's kind of offsides. So maybe we could play... Okay, let's start with bishop c3. Let's see where this goes. Let's start with bishop c3. Okay. Now let's test our opponent with bishop d4. We can always repeat. We can always repeat once. Nothing wrong with that. It's not a draw. If bishop e3, bishop c3 is not a draw. It's not a three-time repetition. We can make a different move instead of bishop d4. But at least we're testing our opponent. Bishop e3 played. Okay, very good. Our opponent is holding very nicely. Now, there's nothing wrong with just trading everything and going for a pawn up endgame, but yeah, this big problem, rook e8 would be amazing, but there's bishop takes d4, and I, I don't like the attack in that resulting position. Maybe it's good for black, but I'm not confident that that's good for black. It feels more like a draw than anything else. All right. In that case, we... What do we do? Okay. Hmm. Okay. Let's go back to C3. Let's play it very simple. Let's play it very, very simple. How exactly do we play it simple is the question. Okay, I have an idea. Okay. We can take and go bishop C4. 
but let's trade these bishops. Not what I wanted to do, but I don't see another option to keep all the winning chances alive. Now bishop c4 is possible and bishop e4 is possible. Bishop c2. Ah, bishop c2 might be very smart. Bishop takes c2, queen takes c2, rook end game. Going to be very difficult for white to defend that in time pressure. Very, very difficult for white to defend that in time pressure. Bishop c2 takes, queen takes c2. That is going to be just a pawn down position, and white is going to have to play perfectly to hold it. Let's do it. Bishop c2. Yeah, bishop c2. Forcing the bishop trade. Now notice rook c1. What is there? There, there is bishop takes b3. Yeah. Hopefully I didn't blunder anything here. Yeah, I blundered g4, I realized. that Actually, that, that might have been a blunder. That might have been a blunder. g4 might have just forced a draw. Yeah, but now g4... Yeah, g4 actually was blundered by me. Okay, that was bad. That was bad, but our opponent missed it. And now we have to keep torturing white. Now we have to keep torturing white. How do we torture white? Okay, first things first. I don't like the placement of this rook. I feel like it's overstayed its welcome on c8. Let's reposition it to a better spot on e8. Yeah, I made a huge blunder here. I should have gone back to c4. I went to c2 and I forgot about g4. We'll investigate after the game. But that was a very sloppy moment for me. But here I'm pretty confident that we can win this with a pawn up and seven seconds now for white. Okay, queen d5 with two seconds. Now, a queen trade in general, I like because it makes it even harder for white to defend. If you can trade queens on the right square and you can hit the pawn while you're doing it, that's even better. So a move that catches my eye is queen e4. Our basic strategy here is to create problems on every move, and again, to try to force white into making decisions with their last couple seconds. Eventually, the hope is that white is gonna blunder. Okay, here, another slow move. We're playing kind of this waiting game, waiting for white to blunder. Queen c5 was very strong, by the way, very strong. Let's go h5, improving our position slowly, forcing white into another decision. Again, white's clock continues to dwindle. We're not doing anything forcing. Queen d6. Okay, so white is kind of staying in place. I'm hesitant about moving the rook up because that gives white a back rank check. I don't really want to allow any tactics, but I see a trap. I see a trap. Let's go rook e6. I'm hoping for a check and then rook d8. This is the what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping, okay, queen d8 check. It's not the check I was expecting because here I don't see a clear follow-up for white, but that's even better. Now we have territory we're threatening before. This pawn is hard to defend and we're kind of inching forward in this position, if that makes sense. Two seconds again. Okay, white's queen d4 check. White finally buckles and trades queens and that's excellent. Here I think we're winning. And we're winning for a couple of reasons. Most importantly, we're up a pawn. But white's king is very poorly positioned here. White's king is cut off along the e-file. So we just have to find the right way to transform this position. So of course we could give a check. In fact, we probably should start with a check. And where do we want our rook? What is the best, what is the best configuration on the queen side? This is what you need to understand. You can't just randomly insert your rook wherever. Or do you start by advancing your king? But there I think white has rook d7. On the other hand there, we can go rook b6. So that's actually not a bad try to start with king f6 and see where that takes us. Yeah. King f6 is not a very committal move. King f6 is not a very committal move. We're keeping all of our options open. And now my intuition is just to go king e5. Yeah. Or to go rook b6 for starters. But king e5 seems more to the point. King e5 seems more to the point. And now rook d7 looks like a fork, right? It forks these two pawns, but because we have this resource, rook b6, it was not dangerous. Now we're very, very close to smoking this rook away from the fourth rank, and rook c6 is going to win the game. This forces a rook trade. That's it. Look at how our king is covering all the important escape squares for white's rook. It's out of squares. White's going to give f4 check, king d5, and then it's over. After the trade, our king is just too well positioned. We're going to go after the b pawn. Yeah, four check is just a spite check. We slide away from the check. And that's it. Quick conversion. Quick conversion. Yeah, rook c6. It doesn't even matter what you take with. You can play bc, king c6. But bc is more clinical, I think. And that's it. Our pawns are perfectly configured. There's no pass pawn uh, to be made on the king side. And by the time white gets the king to the king side, we'll have like two queens on the board. Alternatively, we could have played c5, made a pass pawn that way. We're not trying to conserve the tempo.
resigns. GG. And we made 3,300, uh, 2,300. Okay, I'm really, really upset at myself for missing G4. Let me just get this out of the way immediately. When I played Bishop C2, yeah, this actually should have lost the game for me. This was a blunder. Yeah, this, this was a blunder. The top engine move was, in fact, Bishop C4, as I originally intended. But I played Bishop C2. And the point is that the queen and the rook are the two worst defenders because they're the easiest pieces to attack. So here I, I completely missed g4. I just didn't see this move. And the point is that the only way to keep the bishop defended is to put the queen on e4. But as a result of this move, the rook on c8 now loses the defender. Remember, I even mentioned rook c1, bishop takes b3, and the queen defends the rook. But after g4, queen e4, rook c1, suddenly black loses because the rook is unprotected. The bishop is under fire. And this... Would be interesting, but now queen c3 also picks up the bishop. So the only thing that black can do here... Okay, probably I would have played... The best practical option is to play queen f3. You can also take on d1 and take on b3, but here f6 is very nasty, threatening queen h6. This is very difficult to survive with such a pawn. But I would have played queen f3. And black has two pieces, uh, two pawns for the piece. White's king is weak. It's only plus one, so it's not completely winning. But after queen e2, yeah, queen c3, forking the bishop and the pawn. Okay, this is still very much a game, but white is in the driver's seat. Yeah, I blundered g4. Okay, it looks very easy when I'm showing it to you, when I'm like hand feeding it to you, but it is pretty elementary tactic, but I guess I'm, you know, not that good. So g4 was missed. That should not have happened, but let, having gotten that out of the way, let's go back to the start. Yeah, blunders do happen from time to time, and everybody commits them, and hopefully that... I'm getting... How can you, as a Grandmaster, miss G4? I can't tell if that's a troll question or a real question. Um, yeah, if there's anybody watching who's under the impression that GMs never blunder, then it must be your first day, you know, playing chess, which is fine. Yeah. Um, okay, let me open chess space so I can properly look at the opening. Yeah, I should not have missed g4, but it is what it is. GG to our opponent. Okay, I'm just opening up chess space to check out the opening and feed you the, the, the best uh, theoretical line. Yeah, so c3. This is the delayed alipin. Why is it called the delayed alipin? Because the regular alipin is the immediate c3. This is the alipin. This is the delayed alipin. And as often happens in chess, when a move is played one move later, it leads to completely different positions. So you should not compare the delayed alipin to the regular alipin. The types of positions you get are very, very different. Um, okay, so knight f6 is obvious. We're not going to tackle bishop e2 here. h3 is uh, theoretical enough to where we're going to focus on it for this speed run. Okay, so knight c6, just continuing to develop. And there's a very important line here. If white plays, plays d4... Then, after c takes d4, c takes d4, you actually can take on e4. Now, you might say, but wait a second, white plays d5, forces the knight away, and then forks the other knight and the king. But does anybody know what is the crucial detail here? Why does this line work out for black? You have to know this. Yes, you are the first to the party. Queen a5 check. Give me the square. White, if blocks with the bishop, allows knight takes d2, and then we have time to move this knight or to take the pawn. The main line here is knight c3. And as you should know that in this position, there's another trap. You don't take this pawn because after bishop d2, suddenly there's no check on e5, and black drops the piece. After knight c3, bc, and I'm checking this with the engine, uh, after it looks like the, the new move, yeah, knight d8 seems to be what Stockfish recommends at a high level, just saying... I'm dropping back, keeping everything protected. Black is up a pawn and white's queen side is in shambles. There's a slight development advantage, but we're going to work around it. Um, so queen b3, for example, to protect the pawn. And you just go bishop d7, stopping bishop b5 check. I see two games in the database, both of them at bishop d2. Well, 1995 and 1998. Really interesting. And apparently queen a4 here is the best move. Oh, this is a very nice move. It basically forces the queen trade. Because if queen b2, suddenly we have this fork and we win a second pawn and white's compensation is essentially non-existent. Um, very, very nice little sequence there. Yeah, knight d8 is rare. Uh, knight e5 is the known move, but 
I think knight d8 is very, very solid as an alternative. And b7 is defended, very important detail. So d4 is bad. Bishop d3 is the main move. And now, yeah, g6 is the most popular response. So I remembered this correctly, bishop c2. Oh, and here I, uh-huh, yeah, bishop g7 is also good. Also possible here is to play e5. I see Carlsen versus So. One player who likes to play the system with white is uh, Jaspam, Jose Martinez. He plays this in almost all his blitz games with white. And it's a very, very tricky line uh, because white wants to play d4. So here, yeah, bishop g7 is completely fine. Castles is the main move. And e5 is the top computer choice. So I did remember the correct line here. If white pushes d4 uh, immediately, then the computer just recommends, oh, wow, just castles. Just castles. Um, and if white plays short castle, then you can play c takes d4 and e5, essentially the same type of idea as we played in the game. And here the point is that if white plays d5, where do we put our knight? Just to see if the chat is paying attention. Where do we put our knight? Yeah, not knight d4, that gives up a pawn. No, knight d4 takes, 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 and you have no effective discovery. I don't like this. Not knight e7, nobody's said the correct square yet. Still nobody said the correct square. No, knight b4, yeah, knight b4. This is like one of the main, main ideas of this line, is to play knight b4 at the right moment in order to go after the bishop pair, because white's bishop has to stay anchored to the pawn. Uh, that's not entirely true, but I'm not going to bore you with the details of bishop b3. And if white yields the bishop pair, then, well, black controls the light squares, we're happy. You can play, for example, bishop d7, or you can play it like a king's Indian. You can drop your knight back and quickly push f5. And then the bishop is brought to d7, the rook to c8. We have a great position here, kind of like a king's Indian dream. What I'm kind of skipping is that white actually can play bishop b3. And this is a, a very obscure fork that you should remember. After knight takes e4, queen e1, look at this. Queen forks both knights. And it looks like black drops a piece. And black does drop a piece. But for the piece, you're going to get two pawns. And you're going to get a massive initiative in the center. You're going to play knight takes f2. And black has monumental compensation for the piece. This is actually a known line. Knight takes f2. Yeah, queen takes f2. Knight d3. Crazy line. Fedeseev versus Serrano. There are some GM games here. Now e4. And suddenly after queen takes e4, bang, bang, and b2 falls with a fork. And black is in the driver's seat here. Yeah, amazing line. So there's actually a parallel uh, in the King's Indian. There's a line in the English, which uh, I've caught a lot of players with this. So if white plays the English against the King's Indian, I play a line that Gary Kasparov used to play, rook e8. So here, let me remember how this goes. White goes, it's something like rook b1, c6, b4, d5, takes, takes, bishop g5. Yeah, and here you play bishop e6. And everybody gets really excited here, like, ooh, knight takes e5. But who can spot the right concept? It's queen c7. Yeah, forking both knights. And again, this is still very, very complicated. Black is not better here, but this is the, the general point. These knight forks are very easy to miss. And the Rui Lopez, there's also a line. There's actually a whole concept in a lot of lines. For example, let's take an, an easy illustration. Say white goes, I don't know, c3, and black gets excited. b5, bishop b3, knight takes c4. Players often miss this fork against both knights in the Rui Lopez. So queen forks and bishop forks against the knight or the knight and the bishop can be very, very easy to miss. That's the, the takeaway. Okay, so d4 is not scary. Here we play e5, rook e1. All right, fine, castles. We're still following a bunch of high-level games, Nakamura versus Ter Sahakyan, and d4. White goes for the complications. Um, alternatively, white can play d3 and keep it as a quiet position, but this is a completely separate line, and black is totally fine here. This is not, like, theoretically scary. Hikaru has played like this a couple times, but black can just play, like, bishop e6, queen e7, slowly prepare d5. The position is not that interesting. So let's consider d4, takes, 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 and here, okay, rookie 8, 16 games. 
but it seems like the top engine line is what I was initially intending. Knight takes d4, queen takes d4, and now bishop e6. And the point of this is very, very subtle. You're trying to prevent knight c3. Who can tell me why knight c3 is a bad idea? It didn't matter which pawn we would take with. We could take with the e pawn, it's the same product. Discovered attack, but which move? Pause the video if you're watching on YouTube. Why is this, why is this move knight c3 bad? Yes, good. Not knight takes e4 because if queen takes e4, common blunder, you're forgetting that the queen can move away and take a piece. But knight to d5. This is why we put the bishop on e6. Otherwise, the knight would hang. Now black is better because once the queen drops back, we take, we ruin white's pawn structure kind of like we did in the game, and we can start targeting the c3 pawn. So this line is considered to be the main line. For this reason, the main move here is actually to slide the queen over. No, but that's a bad move. Queen d4 is weird. Queen d1 is what uh, the top guys play. And now, already d5 is very, very strong. d5, e5, and knight e4. Again, this very important idea. And if white plays bishop takes e4, then white's lack of development really, really hurts him. Really, really hurts him. I mean, if you look at this end game, the e4 pawn is completely untouchable because of rook d1 check. And because of our bishop pair and our excellent rooks, black is slightly better. So this is the way to tackle the line. You take on d4, you play bishop e6, and you prepare a quick d5. Following the principle, if your opponent is underdeveloped, try to open the center. Instead, I decided to play rook e8, which I think is totally fine, but it gives white the option of trading on c6 and bringing the knight out to c3. And if white is able to play knight c3, then white has a pretty comfortable position. White is a pretty comfortable position because it's a little bit harder for us to push d5. Uh, once white completes their development, d5 stops being as effective of a move, obviously. Hopefully this is making sense. But our opponent decided to retreat. This allowed us to push d5 in a very nice version. And now black has solved all of their problems. For newer players, you should remember that after e5, uh, you should drop the knight into e4. Very kind of textbook reaction. Not fearing, again, not being afraid that you're eventually going to lose the pawn. That's completely irrelevant. And if you really want to, you can just win the pawn back by giving a check, trading, and playing knight takes e5. You have an excellent position. Uh, so don't be afraid of this whole knight e4 idea. In fact, there are situations where you genuinely sacrifice on e4. And as a result, you get like massive, massive compensation. Let me see if I can find an example on demand. Okay, so not really a example of that of the sacrifice exactly, but just to give you a sense of the fact that this occurs in a lot of different openings. Okay, why is this so? One sec, let me expand the board a little bit. Yeah, so here, for example, is a Sicilian. This idea is very typical in the Sicilian. You push d5, uh, you allow e5, but now you stick the knight in the middle, and this knight is really, really a beast uh, on e4. In this case, we're attacking c3, and yeah, this knight is just very, very strong. So this d5, knight e4 stuff should be filed into your database of typical ideas in a lot of different openings. All right. So our opponent took, we traded, and so we get this open center position, which is definitely more comfortable for black because we have the better pieces. I went through this during the game, but bishop b3 is a very, very accurate move. This is a very impressive move, just kind of keeping the tension and applying pressure on the knight. A lot of newer players probably would have panicked here with white because it's, it's actually really, really hard to find a move. Um, and bishop g5 is not scary. We just slide our queen over, and now white has a very, very hard time defending uh, the b2 the b2 pawn queen c1 we play bishop e6 and the knight comes to b4 very nasty position so okay bishop b3 bishop f5 bishop e6 i was worried about the prospect of knight g5 so i decided to put the bishop on a more active square hopefully that makes sense knight a3 okay and once again queen d7 trying to discourage white from playing bishop g5 but White ended up playing this move, queen d1. And I thought that white should play bishop g5 anyway. And this is very, very high level. But after bishop takes b2, rook d1, suddenly white develops a lot of activity against this knight on d5. And the point is that if black plays bishop takes a3, you should be very careful about any situation where your fianchettoed bishop departs its like fianchettoed square, because that creates a lot of problems with your king side. 
now suddenly white has these mating ideas and white also has a really, really big initiative after rook takes d5. So for example, queen c7, white can actually just come back to d1 and open up the diagonal again. And suddenly your rook doesn't have any squares. You don't have rook d8, you don't have rook e8. Suddenly it's black who has a hard time making a move. And white's got a lot of ideas here. Uh, so remember, if you're winning a pawn, don't make all the concessions just to take a pawn. Try to, it's better to keep the tension and, and better to keep peace activity uh, than to go after a pawn. Okay, so queen d1, knight cb4, defending the knight. This move should make sense. Knight d4 and bishop d3. Knight ac2, rook c8. All of these previous few moves keep the tension. Yeah, and after knight takes before, knight takes before. Oh my gosh, there was... Oh, wow. Oh my gosh. Holy smokes. So there were some inaccuracies here according to the engine, but the point is black is slightly better this whole time. Knight takes before, knight takes before. White's only move to keep equality uh, was to play knight f3. And here the position is objectively equal. What I would argue that after something like queen f5, black is still very much in the driver's seat, practically speaking. Um, you can... If you really want to, you can kind of analyze this position with an engine on your own. Knight g5, there is the move bishop c2. And if bishop f7 check, there's queen f7. The queen is lost. White is down a piece. And in the event of the trade, uh, you have knight takes c2, rook b1. Uh, and now, wow, knight a3, rook a1, rook e8 simply. The knight is untouchable. You're threatening knight c2 and rook e1. The bishop can't move because b2 falls and the rook is trapped. White is totally paralyzed. So that's one interesting line. But crazily enough, a3 is a losing move. But the idea that wins here is insane. Black to play and win. Black has an incredible combination here that I completely missed. I went for the second best option. Just essentially forcing white to give up a pawn. But there was a winning move here. Insane move. Or maybe not so insane now that I see it. So it's the move. Yeah, bishop c2. This has escaped my attention completely. So the point is knight c2 drops the queen because the bishop no longer controls d1. Bishop c2 is easy. Knight takes c2. Again, the problem with, with the queen and white loses a piece. But the line continues. White plays queen to f3, defending the bishop laterally. Bishop takes d4. A, B looks like white is out of the woods. But now comes the second part of the combination. Takes, takes. Looks like white is doing okay. And now bang. Bishop f2, rook takes c1, queen d2 check, queen takes c1, and at the end of all of this, not only is black up a pawn, but white's king is ultra exposed, black is a winning, black is a winning endgame. Complete insanity. Yeah, so this was the winning line, bishop c2. Um, I wasn't thinking about it because I tunnel visioned. I thought, okay, the two candidate moves are queen takes d4 and bishop takes d4. I didn't stop to consider other options. This is a very common problem where you kind of narrow down the search almost immediately. And if I had asked myself, maybe I can look for something else, I think I would have seen bishop c2 because it's not such a difficult move in and of itself. And my opponent might have not found queen f3. That's really, really hard. It's easy to panic here and just take on c2 or whatever. Anyways, I played like this, queen f5, queen e1, a6. I already went over this during the game, but the point is against bishop b3, bishop b2, I don't want the a pawn to hang. So finally, we score a pawn. Great defense by our opponent to force the bishop trade. And here, the important moment where I blundered the bishop c2. Should have played bishop c4, leading essentially to the same position, but without the blunder. This check is not dangerous because of king g7. But I decided to blunder with bishop c2. Our opponent missed it. And this position is not that interesting to me because is it a draw with... Best computer play? Absolutely. White can hold this. I have no doubt about it. Probably even white can trade queens and draw this endgame. But come on. I mean, pawn down endgame. Black can kind of get the king into the center. Go for the B pawn. This is going to be really, really hard to, to hold. Um, and I'm not going to analyze this endgame in this speedrun video. That would be a little bit too much. Uh, the game itself was very, very rich, so I don't want to burden people. So basically, the way that we won this is we got a rook to a better square. We threatened the queen trade, and eventually our opponent ran out of ideas and initiated the queen trade themselves. White should have kept the queens on the board with queen d2. This would have made our job a lot harder, and we would have continued to torture white, maybe h4, you know, maybe rook b6 somewhere to hit the pawn. You're basically combining improving your position 
with creating these annoying situations for white, maybe rook c6, rook c2, trying to cause your opponent to panic, if that makes sense. This is kind of an art form. So the last thing I'll say is that there was a very important detail. White could have done this and tried to go for checkmate. A lot of games have been turned around with this kind of idea. Can anybody spot my counter blow to this? This was actually super important for black to see because why would you allow this attack? We have a queen trade. Yeah, we check on e1. And do we take on f2? No, we check on e5. And we force the queen trade, and the rook perfectly gets to b5. This is the ideal square because it's both defending and attacking. Yeah. So this had to be foreseen. Our opponent did something similar. Probably white should play f4 and try to contain the king. But our opponent collapses, letting the king through and allowing the rook trade. Last chance was to play rook d7. But I am totally positive that this is losing for white because we have the connected passers, and our king is close enough to the king side where we can always defend the g-pawn, so white can't gain any traction on the king side. It's not easy to make a pass pawn. Meanwhile, we just kind of push our own pass pawns. And of course, in rook endgames, you're always looking for an opportunity to initiate a favorable rook trade into a pawn endgame. That's how I found rook c6. I was like, wait a second, the rook is out of squares. Laterally, if we can take away its file, then we win the game. So... Uh, rook c6, and that's it. The game ends. So does the speedrun. But thank you, everybody, for watching. Yeah, we didn't go too deeply into, like, the second part of the game, but I think it was a little bit less interesting than the first. Uh, so critical moments. First of all, we navigated the opening pretty well, got a favorable position. Rook e8, not the best move. Knight takes d4, bishop e6 is theoretically the better option. But knight f3, slight inaccuracy, allowing us to open the center. And then slowly putting pressure, that was the theme of the game. Slowly putting pressure, inducing concessions and time pressure, and eventually our opponent buckled. He did. I didn't punish him properly. Instead, we went for the pawn, and then we went for the blunder, but you kind of get the point. Not the highest quality game, but I think that was pretty instructive. A lot of interesting moments to learn from. Okay, pretty exhausted. This has been a long stream. Let's call it a night here. So thanks, everybody. And I'll see all of you later. Thanks for watching.